record. Hold on. Hello, and welcome to the Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. The Jason Cavanis Experience is brought to you by Cavanis HR. Cavanis HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Our guest today is Deidre Diamond. Deidre, are you ready to be great today? Yes. Deidre has combined her 25 years of experience working in technology and staffing with a love for the cybersecurity community to create CyberSN, a company transforming the way cybersecurity professionals approach job searches. She is also the founder of Secure Diversity, a nonprofit organization dedicated to addressing the cybersecurity talent shortage. Thank you very much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm, it's, I'm happy to be here. So talk about Cybersecurity Network. What actually is that? Absolutely. So CyberSN, we're a national cybersecurity staffing uh, organization with a uh, international cybersecurity job board. So we're the place you go if you want to find talent in cybersecurity. And uh, we are uh, very dedicated to cyber in that we won't work a job that isn't cybersecurity. So how long, how did you get involved in cybersecurity? You know, in 2007, I uh, was asked by uh, the founders I had been working for for 13 years in another company to come to Rapid7 and build out their sales as the first vice president of sales. I took my 13 years of working for them in tech staffing and took that model and put it into software sales and became the first VP of sales at Rapid7. Uh, and was in that position to 50 million of reoccurring revenue. And, uh, and so that's how I got into cyber and met all these amazing cybersecurity professionals that I've really connected with uh, being a criminal justice sociology uh, major myself. So what is like a stereotype of cybersecurity that is, not, that is incorrect? A stereotype? Oh yeah. gosh, that it's all about a keyboard and a hoodie and uh, you know, that uh, there's one, that's the role. That's the only role is the role of, uh, you know, the keyboard and the hoodie. And really uh, one of the things that I've, that the community has really loved that I created years ago, which is now the 35 job categories of really showcasing how vast cybersecurity is. 35 job categories, technical, non-technical, leadership, and, uh, you know, over 112 titles. So uh, that's the m number one misconception is that it's just one role that attacker or defender. And, uh, and then again, it's typically a, a young male <laughs> in a hoodie. Is there a difference between doing cybersecurity for a small company versus a large corporation? Or is it, is it the same skill set? Absolutely. Uh, it's not so much about the same skill set as it is a different need. Right. And skills are, um, you know, really tasks and projects, right? Our ability to complete tasks or projects and the knowledge of what tasks or projects that need completed and the, the, the need of those tasks and projects vary vastly over a small company versus a big company, also versus an industry versus one industry. And so it is another reason why cybersecurity is sort of so misunderstood is that not only is it vast, depending on the organization, it could be completely different need, that, but maybe the same job title. Is there, um, so this is a two part question. Can you talk about the, um Challenges cybersecurity people have finding jobs, both like in a regular no, no circumstance and what's going on right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, let's talk prior COVID-19 first, right? And uh, we've got a broken job searching system, no matter who you are, right? Like we've all experienced what it's like to search for a job. It's endless hours of sending resumes, never hearing back. And when you do hear back, you're probably talking to somebody that ends up telling you it's not a good fit or you know it's not a good fit right away. A big waste of time. 95% of what uh, professionals feel in general of searching for jobs is a lot of wasted time. So we've got this broken system. Then you add cybersecurity to the mix, which is a totally different language than, quote, tech, right? It gets sort of lumped under tech. And yet uh, the language to, of cybersecurity is not a tech language. And so recruiters, uh, you know, don't have the common language down. Organizations in themselves don't really know what they need a lot of the time. And so cybersecurity professionals 
waste even more time with job searching because they run into those two complexes on top of the broken job system, which is the reason why I started CyberSN almost six years ago was I was in, you know, on sabbatical after 21 years of running and building large scale teams and went to Black Hat and uh, had met with a bunch of friends and sort of was hearing everybody not loving where they work and wanting to go somewhere else, but sharing how awful job searching was. And I was out of staffing for 10 years as I was building Rapid7 and such. And, uh, and it really hit me like, wow, I could help. And that's how CyberSN was born. Now I ran into even more challenges we can talk about in a minute that uh, really, you know, cyber professionals have it worse in this broken system based on this, it's a, it's a language that most people don't speak in recruiting. How does someone become qualified to be a cybersecurity specialist? Do they have to do a degree? Is it certifications, job experience? What's the most common way? Well, there's no common way, you know, of course, you know, certifications and degrees are something that everybody would love to have and from a hiring perspective as well as a professional having, but they, co they cost money and, and time and people need sponsorship. In general, the shortage is so bad in cybersecurity that uh, people don't, they will take you without a degree or without a, cert uh, a certification for over experience all day long. How hard or easy is it to become a cybersecurity specialist? Like example for, you can be a construction worker and decide I'm gonna go to a coding academy for six months and you're a software developer, right? Is it that easy to become a cybersecurity person? Is there a longer process? You know, if we're talking about a, a technical cybersecurity person and analyst, and then moving up through sort of the incident response and engineering and, you know, th those application security and all of that, those technical roles, they're, they're um, I don't know how to answer difficulty. What I can tell you is that it's, um, it's a skill that has to be developed and it takes years and years and the longer you know the, the more the, there's always more to learn to move up through the sort of technical knowledge and it does require the you know somebody who to be interested in the work and they could have a math background and they could not have a math background they just really would have to be interested in doing the work you have to learn you got to understand how uh, you know, uh, information is transferred uh, through the internet of things and at all levels. And then you've got to really, you know, sort of learn the systems of, of uh, defending and the technologies. And, and then you got to learn how to, how to triage and work things and then become specialized and move, move, move up. And so these are, these technical roles are, are um, very uh, uh, serious in terms of skills development. You're not going to learn it in, and then stop learning. You're going to keep going and it doesn't take months. It takes years. How long has there been a talent shortage? Is it, is it like a forever kind of thing or is it just recently? Yeah, it certainly is forever. It's just that the need has become to come to corporate America. You know, uh, the government was the first to protect, uh, right? Technically protect information and what have you. And so it really came to us much later. And that's what escalated the, the gap. Can you talk some about always the importance of always looking for a job? Well, when I think of always looking for a job, I think of, uh, I think of, of just being involved in your community because what you don't want to be is caught off guard in a broken system and not know anybody, you know? Uh, so to me, always looking for a job just means really be connected in your community, go and participate in local, uh, you know, cybersecurity communities or what have you. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, making it such that you have uh, options, if you will. That being said, that being said, what you what 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 uh, I took that in and then turned it into my platform, which is post a, a public um, profile. Your identity is not there on uh, at all, nor is the actual company names that you work for. But it's a a resume, if you will, for cybersecurity professionals, such that uh, employers all over the world can apply to you, meaning they can tag you they touch you and say, Hey, would you be interested in my job? And yet they don't really, they don't know your name. They don't know your gender. Don't know exactly where you are, but I have created something that matches everything enough to do to where it's not going to be a waste of time. And so that is the no more platform. And, and, and I really built that because there's no way I could service everybody. 
And I've been using this technology for matching for years. It's how I built this firm. And I want people to find jobs easy. It's really hard and it causes a lot of emotional pain. And I want people to be able to move states, move countries, you know, try something new. And so, you know, no cyber professionals don't want to be on LinkedIn because of identity, but also LinkedIn isn't a matching system. And so I wanted to take out also that sort of like waste of time matching or, you know, phone calls. And so uh, it's a big deal. And, you know, we just launched at Black Hat and we're, we're going to continue to build it. We're onboarding uh, 47 uh, professionals a week. And uh, this is a way to change the game. It's, it's really a mess, actually. So I was talking to a friend the other day and she has a small business. And she told me how this person, she hadn't heard from her in three years, contacted her last week and said, hey, I got laid off. You, do you have any open position for me, right? I'm thinking, so if you contact, this person contacted you out of the blue after three years, right? And, like, mm -hmm. and you can't do that, right? You got to build a relationship, add value. You just can't out of the blue ask someone for a job, right? That's, that's the way you job network, I don't think. Yeah, I mean, you know, if that's, your, if that's the number one way you can get some sort of response, then it's all in your approach. Hey, I know we haven't talked in three years. I saw this ad posted and I'm really interested. It's a company you work at and you know, would you, would you mind spending a few minutes with me about it or something? Um, you know, so it's hard to keep relationships with everybody, but that's how bad broken, that's how bad job searching is. Right. I mean, you don't hear back when you send your resume, you don't. the job descriptions don't make any sense, uh, to cyber professionals. So, uh, you know, super hard, super hard. So I know in the, in the tech world, there's a big thing. There's a lack of females in tech, right? Is that the same way in um, cybersecurity? Yeah. Yeah. We're somewhere between 15 and 19 or so percent. Uh, it's getting better, but yes, it's still very low. And you have a nonprofit that's happened to improve that, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Secure diversity is, uh, we're almost five years and our goal is to, you know, provide free education of the 35 job categories, make sure that everybody, primarily women, but everybody understands how many different types of jobs there are here and what those roles would look like and what you'd be doing and how to get involved. And I think it's really important to be able to show people the, how vast, right? So they can pick and get involved and then provide free training and uh, full day events with female speakers and do all kinds of great stuff with uh, our events. So you switched from sales and operations to cybersecurity. How did that process come about? Like, was it hard, easy? Yeah, you know, uh, I switched, but I switched from a leadership perspective, meaning, you know, I've always been either vice president of sales or CEO for the last uh, 15 years of my life or 20 probably now, I'm 28 years in. So very early, you know, at that position. And so I have a cybersecurity team that reports to me. I have a chief security officer and, and his team and they're awesome. They, in fact, they won the Sands Kringle Con challenge this uh, last year. And, and so they're super special and I understand it. I understand what it is. And yet I, I can't have uh, my domain be every specialty, right? So my specialty is sales, which is win-win communication, emotional intelligence, you know, the ability to solve problems, uh, bring teams together. That's what sales really is. Sees how to create a win-win. And, uh, and so I, and then I build around me amazing people and their ability to build amazing teams. And so through that, I have conversations with our chief security officer and I am always learning and able to support him so that he can support me and vice versa. And, uh, you know, I don't believe that one has to be technical to do that, uh, because I'm not. And, uh, and I haven't ever written a line of code. And uh, while I understand how information flows, I am certainly no SME. And, and yet I can work with folks. And, and, and I expect that the same of you know, the leaders on my team don't you know, claim to be sales leaders either. You know, we all have our domain, if you will. So this is a presumption on my part. But my assumption is most cybersecurity people are like great. They're technically great but maybe not do a great job selling themselves or being a people person. How do we, how do you improve that? Or is that a wrong assumption on our part? Yeah, it's uh, it's not necessarily a wrong assumption. It's just that, you know, we, 
I think society hasn't spent the time and the money training anybody other than salespeople with those skills. And so that's how I feel. I feel like, oh, I was given this gift of amazing sales training right out of college, which was all about win-win communication and lean language and, um, you know, nobody comes to work to fail and, you know, things like that. And unfortunately, everybody else wasn't getting that content. I call that emotional intelligence skills. I was given training for 15 years. And so uh, really that's what we have to do. So I teach a lot of these seminars actually on emotional intelligence for cyber professionals. I, ISC Square certifies uh, my classes and gives credits uh, again on win-win communication, making and managing measurable agreements. Like these, this is how we sell ourselves. We sell ourselves by how we show up. We sell ourselves by how we communicate with those we work with both above next to us you know below us wherever in an org chart it's all about communication can you talk about if your platform is for em employers and candidates both correct yeah yeah so employers can come and post jobs for free uh, and they can use our job building technology so that they can make jobs that make sense for cyber professionals. It's very lean language and specific, and they can even export the job and use it in ways to create org charts, to sell for getting budgets for their positions to, you know, those, uh, that they need to sell to, uh, and they can post their job and professionals can apply to it. Uh, there, there's also, um, the ability for the professional to post a, a public profile and, and let perfect, let, uh, employers apply to them. And, and, uh, so it is a recruiting platform. We haven't, we've been using it as our own recruiting platform for years and we've just made it external. Uh, so we're on the journey of bringing it to everybody so that we can get all this churn. I call it search and match. That's why I say where we're talent meets the match. Search and match is broken. Dating apps totally solved our search and match problem with relationships. Like they did, like they took our divorce rates and flipped them on their head because you have options. You're not, you know, just meeting one person here at the bar or at work or what, you know, it, it gave options. So people found better matches for them. And I see that in employment as a problem. And uh, that's why I built this platform. That's why it's called No More, where talent meets its match. And it's all about solving search and match. So if we're all in one place, if we're all in, you know, this specific profession, I really believe all professions is, you know, ought to do this. And certainly the platform's capable of scaling to that, uh, is, you know, we're all in one place, common language job description, common language resumes, I call them profiles, the ability to match. And then of course you need humans to do the rest, but like that search and match part is crushing us all, you know, in terms of finding the job that feels exactly like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited versus, no, oh, it's, it's probably good enough because you've been hiding interviewing behind your boss's back and had like three interviews, you know, cause, and, and one was good enough, you know, like, no, no. When there's tons of opportunities and you get, to, you see three maybe when you're job searching, uh, you know, cause that's all you can get. Yeah. No, that's just like, it's like, it's such a disservice that we can't search and match ourselves, you know? That's a great point. So the graduating class of 2020, you know, their senior year pretty much got canceled. They're going to not the best job market. You know, it's, it, you know, like between today and three months ago, it's a completely different dynamic, right? What yeah. advice do you have these new graduates come to this, you no, know, not great job market? Well, here's the deal. Listen, it, to this day, our clients have not laid off. Our clients have not laid off a single cybersecurity professional. Now, I expect we'll see a few. And I expect that those few will find jobs very quickly uh, in under 30 days, maybe 60 max, um, max. Uh, and, and, and that is because we really can't live without cybersecurity professionals. There is an attack uh, happening all the time, attacks happening all the time. And people are already understaffed because we're on, in a shortage. So what I will say is, that this industry is going to hold up well. If you even look at cybersecurity stocks, they are holding up extremely well. And so what we've got here is the same thing I was talking about earlier, entry level, right out of school, 
no experience or little experience is already pre-COVID-19, a broken system of how to get in. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, COVID-19 made it harder for sure because things are kind of on hold. So while my clients aren't laying off, they're also, everybody's just kind of staying steady and figuring out their play and their plans a little bit, right? And uh, being more conservative than not. Uh, I shouldn't say everybody, plenty are hiring, but you know, lots of them are, are holding steady. And so that's going to probably, you know, hurt some internships and some entry level hires, but it won't be long, you know, it won't be long. It'll kind of be as the country opens up, you know, uh, so because when you're training entry level, being together kind of matters. It's very hard to train when you're not sitting next to somebody all day, or at least can be close enough to be together. So that's going to slow down a little bit. But at the end of the day, it's still a broken system. We don't have a lot of succession planning of, you know, these systems of bringing in entry level people like we see in IT today, you know, that took years to create. Uh, and I would encourage them to apply to government jobs. I would encourage them to apply to those organizations that are doing well right now, like telecom, like, uh, you know, all of our online services, like uh, pharmaceutical, uh, like the managed service organizations uh, for security. Uh, you know, I would encourage smart sourcing, as we call it, smart job searching. And then on my website, I've been doing lately quite a few of these. I did one for Berkeley. I'm doing one for Duke next week. I did one yesterday for an organization called WESIS that's uh, bringing women into cyber too. Uh, exactly how to job search resume right, right now for entry level. And I'll be posting them on my website at cybersn.com uh, over the course of the next week or so. And so I would encourage people to listen to those too, such that there is, you know, we only have so much time in the day and there is a way to do it better than another way in terms of this searching through this uh, broken system. So we kind of cover this through our conversation, but I believe on April 14th, you post an article on LinkedIn about the state of cybersecurity job search right now, I believe it was. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I started that on that date and then I've been doing, um, I'm going to do one every week to week and a half to give, you know, what are we seeing at CyberSN? And, and that week I certainly shared that, um, you know, things were very much on hold, but a small portion was moving forward about 30% and hiring and making offers and continuing to interview and just talked about how people were feeling and what challenges that on um, both the employer side as well as the professional are seeing. And I plan to keep posting that every other you know week and a half or so this week when I posted you know we're seeing a little bit more movement still no layoffs as I mentioned um, we saw uh, you know um, some silver linings in mental health in terms of people who never get to work at home or spend this much time with their family and you know have found a lot of goodness as well in silver lining in some of this and so I share what we're hearing what I get with my my staffing leaders and their teams and, you know, hear what they're hearing and create a blog also in what I'm hearing and share it with the community. So let's suppose I'm a small business owner. I have 25 people. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm like a construction company or maybe a towing company or restaurant. Why should I even be concerned about cybersecurity? That's for, that's for, that's for big corporations, right? Why do I have to be worried about this? Well, it all depends. The first thing to think about is, are there any compliance uh, regulations that your business is legally obligated to follow? And that's the first reason to care that, or I should say the first reason most people care is because if you're not following those regulations sooner rather than later, you will be fined. And those are things for like processing credit cards or holding personal uh, information or um, personnel records, privacy laws, right? Uh, and so, you know, that's usually what gets people to care. The rest is, you know, brand damage. Uh, should uh, somebody want to do that to you or ransomware and your systems, uh, you know, of operations are shut down because somebody has uh, froze your stuff and is asking for money. Uh, things that can really harm operations uh, are above and beyond compliance, believe it or not. And I, didn't that just happen, I think, in Baltimore somewhere where someone, a hacker came in and locked down all, all the computer stuff and, and wanted a ransom or something? 
I can't remember what every it's day to cities. It happened uh, to the San Francisco airport last week. It's happening to major, it's happening to uh, lots of people and it will happen to everybody who doesn't, you know, uh, do some level of protection. It's uh, if there's a will, there's a way. So I'm a small business owner. You've convinced me I need to bring on a cybersecurity person. What do you recommend? I do an internal hire, outsource, or how do, if, I, yeah. if I hire someone, how do I even go about figuring that out? Because I have no idea what cybersecurity does. Like, how do any of you hire all that kind of yeah. stuff? Yeah, it, it all depends on, you know, who you are. I would not recommend just hiring somebody. I would recommend having a consultation uh, such that we can understand what you your compliance uh, regulations do apply to you and also understand the business enough to make a recommendation. It is not true that... Uh, an organization has to hire a cybersecurity professional, and it may be that that's the way to go. It's really something that individually we would work through through a consultation. It doesn't take long uh, to 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 you know get a plan in place and to, and to understand, which is nice. So I'm a small business owner. I, I bring someone on to do cybersecurity. How do I know they're actually doing what they're supposed to do? Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the consultation piece is to really understand what your needs are. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to rely on somebody's truth, just like I rely on somebody's truth. Right. You, although, you know, there's proof behind what truth people provide, meaning to say that, you know, you need to implement a, a DLP, a data loss protection piece of software. And, and somebody recommends that to you. And here's why you need to you know, implement it, here's what it's going to do for you. And it falls into the overall strategy. You know what I mean? So it's like, it, it really is something that people that aren't technical can understand. And you must work with people that are willing to make sure you understand it. It is not magic. You know, it's not uh, true that one needs to be technical to understand. Just keep asking the right questions and make sure you work with people, not the right questions, but keep asking questions until you understand what people are talking about because you don't have to be technical to understand it. That's the good news. What's the vision or long-term plan for your company? We want to change exactly how people uh, search for jobs and get found. So international job, this board, this uh, job platform being used internationally for all cyber jobs, period. That is my, that is so that so a cyber professional can literally never have to actual job search as we think of it today. And so that an organization can always have access to people that are qualified for their jobs and make it super easy to communicate. Imagine like right now people are moving jobs every 18 months and I can tell you it's not money. It's not money. So guess what it is? It's wrong matches, wrong matches, great intentions on both sides, wrong matches everybody's behind everybody's moving quickly and it, it has to slow you know we have to be able to do this in a way where we're not feeling this pressure you know again when you're job searching you're hiding behind your employer's back not a lot of time not a lot of you know uh right so imagine the amount of settling that happens on both sides without people even really knowing they're settling and job searching already is stressful, emotional, right? So I want to, I want to end that. I want to make it so that all the that it actually is the right, you know, fit in terms of the job. Now it's like let's let's talk. Let's make sure personalities and everything else work. So for instance, a security engineer could literally be do fifteen different types of jobs. And so what job do they want to do at this stage in their career is, is a part of it too. So it's not just, are they qualified? Are they interested? So we match on qualified and interested. It's what I've been doing for ever, uh, you know, without technology, we turned it into a platform oh, probably four years ago internally. And now it's for the world. And I want to see everybody uh, be able to find each other and, and match in a way that gives more opportunity. I want to do what the dating apps did change the game of job satisfaction. Yes, and then everyone's economic situation plays a part too, right? It, it, depending on your situation, you might need to take the first job you're gonna get, regardless if you want it or not, you know, and. Yes, yes. And if you've got jobs that actually, you know, apply to your profile, if you will, at all times, well then, you know, you'll never feel that way, so to speak. Since there's a shortage, that's how it's just gonna be. There's gonna be more people, you know, but that's not the way it works today. That's not, I know I'm flipping this thing completely around and doing exactly what the data in the app said. Like, no, let's give, you know, let's sort this out, you know, in terms of what you're really looking for. 
Uh, right now, everybody cut and pastes job descriptions from everybody else's job descriptions. Like, that's how we create job descriptions in the United States. And then we, we, cut, we put inside of them all this five years, this, six years. Like, that's not, that's not a job description. And it's not true most of the time that it takes five years to know that or do that or you know and what if somebody with 15 years wanted to do that what if you know the, that time in their life they just wanted to work somewhere down the street from them house their house and they'd be happy doing that like who's to judge like that's the wrong way to judge as a staffing specialist that make matches happen all day long my life even in sales i see it the same way matches win-win i see it as so inefficient it drives me you know nutty that i created this platform you're talking about SaaS you know, millions of dollars, international platform. Uh, that's how much I believe we can do it in employment. And I'm going to prove it in cybersecurity. This is what gets to me. You have so many people out there. I'm a hiring expert. Are you really a hiring expert? You tell me every person you hired, like, was a perfect match. I, I don't you know. I, that just drives me crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot involved. A lot involved to making good matches. At the end of the day, we're humans. And, and you're gonna have issues to begin with, just in personalities. And so what we can't do is match the job wrong. And you know, CISOs and chief security officers get this the worst because every, you know, there's literally could be 50 different types of chief information security officers. And yet an organ, you know, the job descriptions are so vague that the chief information security officers just try to figure it out themselves and can find wrong fits easily. easily. Yes. Next, change this up a little bit. Can you talk about why HR is important? You know, <laughs> you're talking to somebody that um, has worked for all my companies and we've had very small HR departments and um, we, we always relied on them to make sure that, uh, you know, policies and, and laws were followed, right, in, in terms of employment. You need that support. It changes all the time. Different cities, states that you're working to fill jobs. You know, I really, I really rely on those people to help me understand what I need to understand in the cities and states I need to hire. I would imagine that if there's a recruiting department within human resources, then then I'm, I would. I've never had that. Uh, you know, we've always done. Just, each department does their own recruiting. Uh, is um, re even you know more important because without talent going nowhere companies are going nowhere so you got to have a recruiting department that can attract people and that's why recruiting is sales like i started in sales in january of 94 and my job was recruiting <laughs> but i started in sales and it's because i'm selling my clients uh opportunity i'm selling the story of the hiring manager i'm selling the story of the job I'm selling the professional to the hiring manager and why I think they'd be a good fit and what, you know, what they've been doing with their time and why they're leaving their company. And that's, that's sales. It's got to fit. It's like, you got to sort of, is the reason for leaving of the professional meeting what the, the company can answer. And, and to me, that's sales. It's, it's finding win-win. It's, it's, it's solving those pieces to those puzzles, talking to people in a way that gets the information that you can connect people together so without that companies are going nowhere you bring up two good points one is people don't realize how much hr should be like a sales on sales and marketing on right because hr to me is an employer brand right so you got to market that, you got to sell that you got to sell the company to to the candidates and to the current employees so you can retain them right yeah and those people are touching other humans in the most emotional way we have to be touched outside of you know, sort of love relationships, which is employment, the, the, the most emotional, you know, we all rely on it to put a roof over our heads, education, food, right? Leisure. Like it's, it's like without it, there's problems. We live in harm's way. And so those people interact, those recruiters, those HR folks interact with those people in that time of for, for emotional state for that human. There is more damage to be done on a brand in that moment than your customer service people or your sales people could ever do. Yes, I was talking to someone recently, like how, of course, a lot of companies laying people off, but a lot of them are doing the wrong way, right? And just ruining their employer brand. 
Oh gosh, In, you know, layoff being done poorly is absolutely a brand uh, damager, but so is interviewing poorly. So is the recruiters interviewing poorly. So is like not getting back to people while they're interviewing. Like that's enough to really, you know, bother people. They spent time with your organization, multiple, multiple hours, and you're not gonna tell them what your thoughts are. You're not going to give them feedback. That's what, that's like the biggest turnoff ever. And that's what a lot of HR recruiting departments are doing. And they're blaming legal laws and all this stuff. And it's like, come on, you know, like there's ways to, to comply and there's ways to, to, to create a brand and, and recruiting is a, is a either going to make a company or break a company in my opinion. So next point you brought up, I think is good. Most people don't realize that HR is different in each location. H, yeah. you know, minimum wage law might be different. Or everything can be different. So you might be a company with 10 different locations. You yeah. got to gotta know the rules at 10 different locations. So what goes at one place won't go to the other place. Hours, breaks, time off, uh, health care laws. Like there's differences everywhere, whether you have one person there or a thousand people there. Yeah. Understand you have been for our listeners today. I do. Well, you know, it's really for everybody right now. Uh, my heart goes out to uh, everybody. We're all impacted by this, uh, this health crisis. And I thought to myself and talked to my team, and we launched this a couple of weeks ago, what can we do uh, to help? We know there's a lot of cybersecurity leaders right now that are truly buried in too much work, and we're hiring um, uh, before this all happened and which means their staff is now overworked even more. So we thought we know that budgets can be tough to get, uh, to use an outside agency. And so we said we would give our services at cost, meaning cyber SN makes no pro profit. Our teammates get paid for their work. And so we're, we're willing to find talented cyber professionals for organizations, uh, during this crisis that have been really impacted, uh, at cost. Thank you so much for doing that. That's very valuable. Um, and for our listeners, we're going to have the link to her gift and her social media links at our blog. And our blog is at www.cabinetsachtrblog.com. And be sure to share this podcast with your friends and network. So we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice on any subject you want to talk about? I just, I really want to spread the word about emotional intelligence again. It's the ability to, to really think about how others feel, think, and perceive before we engage them and during the time of engaging them and that's what can really create win-win conversations and we need more teamwork we need people to stick together and and work projects that uh take years and together and so if we're going to be able to accomplish those projects then it's really the emotional intelligence that will be key to this and so i really want to inspire people to go you know, uh, understand that your those skills are, you know, something you can still, you know, gain, improve. They never cap out like IQ caps out in your, by, by your mid early twenties. Uh, EQ skills don't, it's been proven. You can, you can really grow your emotional intelligence at all ages. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate your time too. Thank you very much. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every